Well, hello, it's Mike Delinsky here. I'm going to be moving into the area of, uh, of pollination and bloom is going to come on us very quickly. We've just sort of been getting through herbicide application in some cases, cases across the prairies. Uh, we're a little later, but inevitably pollination and bloom comes on faster than we think. So we want to be prepared to deal with any kinds of stresses and consider some action to preserve yield potential if it's needed. I want to make a few general comments uh, first is uh, I'm going to be going through this with a whole series of photographs that I've taken and some line drawings about uh, how plants pollinate in case some of you guys and gals haven't uh, been exposed to this since you were in grade school or even um, university perhaps. So uh, we're going to go through that but uh, initially I want to make a comment that when we're dealing with this area of moving into pollination fertilization. Uh, I'm a great believer in, in tissue testing as a way to determine what nutrients uh, are short or in good supply in your crop and maybe which ones you can supplement. Um, most farmers aren't tissue testing. So as a result, when it comes to applying some sort of a foliar treatment, uh, you're just throwing a little bit of a kitchen sink at them, hoping that it covers the nutrients that are an issue. And, and I don't mind that, that approach. Uh, I mean, in most cases, one nutrient generally isn't your, your limiting factor. So a small package of nutrients that are useful in stress management and overall plant function is kind of useful. And, and I'm a believer that NPK are always required at every time, uh, every time you go across the field to some degree because those build the, the cells. Uh, potassium is really key to the movement of nutrients, potassium. Uh, as we move later into the season, uh, becomes less and less available from my experience uh, in the days with Agritrend. Uh, as the soil dries up, uh, the potassium is tied up in, in the clay lattices and becomes tough to get. And, and we need that to move nutrients as the plant is moving into maturity and seed development. So those are some general comments that I want to make. And uh, I will sure encourage you, we've got plenty of time yet, if you haven't to, to get some tissue testing done on your plants. And if you do that over a number of years, you really have a better idea on just what nutrients may or may not be a, of concern to you. And you can link that to your soil test. And now that we've got soil moisture probes everywhere, uh, starting to develop across the prairies, uh, sooner or later, you're gonna need all that stuff so you can make better decisions based on your water supply uh, as the roots go down and precipitation accumulates, you want to have a really good handle on, on your water. And that's going to make your decision making a whole lot better. But for now, let's take a look at pollination and fertilization. Well, on this growth curve, which is typical of all plants, we, we have this buildup of biomass to reproduction. And then as we get into reproduction, we get the, the sink changes from the roots, which were used to build all this foliage and to build all the reproductive parts is going to then switch to filling the seed and as time goes on we start losing our green area index as plants start moving nutrients from lower leaves to supplement the uh, nutrient supply from the roots up into the seed to finish off your seed and, and eventually give you your crop. So we're somewhere in this curve here some of you are maybe back here where germination was really slow some of you are further further along so we're going to have kind of a my guess is a a fairly lengthy bloom period across the prairies this, this coming summer. But very soon we'll be here and by the time we get here we're getting a little late in terms of applying nutrients to support uh, pollination because by now we're you know pretty well 50 percent pollination which generally is about 30 percent because you're losing blossoms and getting some pollinated. Uh, so we're, we're maximum pollination when the field is bright yellow like this. A couple of general things. <clears throat> when we look at the nutrients that we're generally supplying, pH is a factor for, for a lot of guys, uh, and again, gals, uh, once you get a, into that pH around eight, you start noticing that things like copper and zinc, manganese, iron, become more difficult to get, including boron. So for, for those folks with those higher pHs, you're generally gonna have a, a difficult time getting those micronutrients into the plant, not so much on the phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, and sulfurs. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind. 
Uh, one of the other things I picked up out of the Canola Council is this, and I'll just read it. Hot days, 28 to 30 degrees and up, and warm nights uh, from bud to mid-flowering stages can have a devastating effect on canola yield. Cool nights offer some recovery from hot days. Warm nights do not provide a recovery period, and more flowers are aborted, uh, producing blanks along the stem. So we know from history that canola doesn't do well under those extreme heat conditions. And some of the things we can do with, with micronutrients and macronutrients, potassium, for example, is really key in terms of stomata, opening and closure, temperature regulation, polyamines, and, and some of these micros are really important in terms of stress management, which occurs when it's really hot and the stomata are closing and we get uh, a, a lot of uh, shortage of water, and that's really stressful on the plants. And when it's closed, we get, we get uh, reactive oxygen species forming. So keep that in mind, but basically here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a look at, uh, and this is just an overall you know, book, book diagram, but we have, we have a couple of things here just to re refresh your memory. Uh, anthers are, are the male part of the plant are produced here, and pollen is produced in the anther. Uh, this is where the, the seed is formed right down here in the egg sac. And this is the, the stigma where pollen will land and then grow a pollen tube down into here to move the male genetics to the female so that we get pollination and the formation of a seed. And that's what we're going to talk about in much greater detail. And, and some of the factors that influence whether you're going to be successful in having pollination, but kind of the fun details of how this actually takes place. Uh, you may never have heard it. Uh, and I'll show you the photographs. And I'll use canola primarily as my model. Uh, most of the uh, so-called nutrient flower enhancement packages that go on are aimed at the what are called dicots or, or the dicotyledonous plants, the broadleaf plants, not so much the grasses. And today, just as an educational thing, dicots are now called eudicots. So you'll probably see that in the literature from here on in. So let's start. Here's here are our uh, flower buds on canola on the uh, as the plant has has uh, elongated, and you can see these are colon leaves here, small ones. But these bud clusters are where we're going to look at because the bud clusters start in the primary uh, bud cluster in the rosette, and then as stem elongation takes place, uh, you can see that there are bud clusters at basically every node on the plant and they're concentrated. So let's take a look inside of there. So here's that little bud cluster and here's one of them. So I just cut it open and I do this in the basement of my house here. So it's kind of sloppy sometimes, but you'll get the idea. Let's look at it closely. So you can see even when they're tiny like this, this is the stigma. And here we go, we get a little closer. You can see that this is the stigma. And I should tell you that this stigma becomes the pod. The tip is where the pollen lands and the seeds are in here and there's, these are the anthers on the side. And here's a real, another shot. You can see that the anthers are a bit bigger. They're green and maturing. And here's the stigma. And because it's, it's really tiny, yeah, you couldn't see, but the ovules are already in the stigma in the ovary sac, even at this stage. As soon as you see the bud, basically all the ingredients, the, the stamens here where the pollens form, and the stigma, which becomes the pod, is already formed. So you have been supporting the growth of this reproductive component right from the time that you can visually see the, the actual buds in the rosette. And here's a close-up. Here are the anthers, stigma, and here are the seeds in there. I'll show you another one. This is another shot, similar thing. You can see here that the anthers are quite large, the stigma is quite large, and I've cut through it. Another shot. Now here we go to a more mature bud, and let's take a look inside of it. Here when we cut it open, you can see I sliced this one open, and you can see the, I'll show you some close-ups of this, but you can see the little seeds right here. All your canola seeds are already there, but they have to be pollinated, and you can see that the anthers, which are producing the male, are starting to get bigger and almost turning a little yellow. And then when we cut into it, you can see that the seeds are hooked right here to what's called the septum, which runs sort of down one side of the seed pod 
because you know when you open the seed bud when it's mature it pops open on one side and at the base of that it's held together like a hinge well during the growth of that all those seeds uh, the plant feeds all of those seeds through that little seam there where it hinges because it's got to be fed and matured and you can see the stigma is out of focus here but there are the seeds already formed and it's connected to that septum by a little appendage here uh, and I'll show you this in a close-up with peas which are a much bigger seed and easier to see so it's fed throughout its life we can see now that the petals are forming or formed coming yellow the anthers are yellowing and the seeds are getting a bit bigger here's a look inside the stigma or the pod as it's forming and you can see the seeds are just continuing to grow so by the time you get to the bud cluster and it's getting ready to pollinate you've already been supporting the growth of all this reproductive component along with the leaves and the stem and the roots now you understand why that that growth curve is so massive and why the plant, uh, once it starts really growing, it needs so much nutrients because it's got to grow all this biomass before it blooms. Because once it goes and starts pollinating, its hormones change and as a result, the sink now becomes the actual seed versus the roots and some of the photosynthetic material that the plant produces that used to go to the roots is now diverted up into the seeds and if the plant is deficient and it can't draw those nutrients from the ground which is you know which is why we grew all those roots turns dry the roots aren't moving there's no moisture in the ground and things that move by mass flow can't move to the roots the plants become short of those nutrients and if it's too long under stress then we start losing some yield potential this is kind of common thing we hear about all the time so now we have these buds ready to go we then get to a point where we're seeing our first flower and before long we see all the outside flowers you can see the outside buds in the bud cluster are bigger they mature first it starts forming flowers and then eventually the whole bud cluster will be in bloom i'll just show you a few other things for guys you know i don't want to just focus totally on canola here's corn this corn's about a foot and a half tall, uh, maybe two leaf form. And you can see here are the anthers right here. Here's the, co there's cobs or somewhere here, I can't see, oh, right here. The cobs are right here. So let's take a close look. You can see that if you cut across the anther where the male pollen, or male genetic material pollens form, it's important to note that the pollen is attached to the edge of the anther because it has to be fed throughout its life. So it has to get nutrients up. And flower parts have a difficult time getting nutrients because there isn't a lot of transpiration. So it's got to be fed mostly through flow and movement rather than root nutrient moving up into the into there. There's not a lot of chloroplasts, if, if any, in, in, in the anthers because they're hidden from the sun. So it has difficulty getting nutrients. And when we're approaching the uh, sort of bloom period and that buildup of the, of the buds, there's always a struggle in terms of carbohydrate and where it's gonna go when it's stressed. So uh, sometimes we don't get as, as good nutrition to the pollen and that, that leads to poor pollen. But before it, uh, the pollen is released, uh, it's, uh, it's gotta be removed from the edge and be able to, to leave. In other words, the plant dries it when it's mature, so it'll flow in the air because these plants are cross-pollinated, you know, and you want to have bees also available to actually pick up that pollen and help you in, in pollinating plants. You can see the same thing here with peas. Uh, these are anthers in peas, and you can see that this one is much more advanced than the next one because there's a sequence of, of blossoms that come on. Just like in canola, there's always a sequential, and some are ahead of the others the first ones to to bloom are usually the biggest pods and the biggest seeds lower lower on the plant and the pollen is much more advanced so here we are just uh we've now got the plant ready to pollinate here's the stigma on the plant this becomes the actual pod and here are the anthers you can see that they're not quite mature the stigma is a little longer and we can see a little thrip living right down here and you'll find a lot of thrips running around in here 
because they like the pollen, they feed on pollen and they don't do much damage. Other than from time to time, I've watched them and they will nibble on the stigma here, lower down, and that generally will cause those curled pods you see in the field. When you see those curled pods, that's usually because some thrips were feeding on it, causes a hormone distortion in the plant and the, and the, the actual pod then curls. So just go back for a second uh, on terminology. These are called stamens. That's where the anthers are. This is the anther and this is the filament and the whole thing is called the stamen. And these, this is the stigma where the pollen lands and you can see it as well. I'll show it better on canola. And then you, here's your embryo sac and this is wheat where the eggs are in that floret are and in, in each, uh, each pod. Uh, the seed is there. There's only like one seed in each floret here, but in a pod there's 25, 30 seeds. So there has to be a pollen tube growing to each. Uh, just to show you a few other things, this is lentil. And you can see in this particular lentil here, you've got all these anthers, which have produced the pollen. And you can see that the tip of the stigma here has got all that pollen. So it'll grow a pollen tube down here and then we get that pod formed and there's your lentil. So the process is the same basically in all, as I said, angiosperms, which are the pollinating plants. So we can use various plants to show, uh, use this model. But here's a diagram that really summarizes it all. Uh, and it's a potted kind of plant, could be pea, canola, you know, lentil, chickpea, whatever. So uh, here's the pollen grain. We have the stigma up here where it lands, grows a pollen tube down through the septum into this funiculus, funiculus, which is right here and into the uh, ovule sac here. And then the pollen tube then has two germ cells which are released. One fertilizes the egg, the other one goes here to the central cell and becomes the endosperm. Now in, in things like peas and canola, we don't have an endosperm at the end of the day like we do in wheat where, where we have a germ and an endosperm. In things like peas, there's just a cod, uh, a cotyledons to have, you know, cotyledons there, and in peas and so on. So, so what happens is that even though there's an endosperm uh, formed initially, that endosperm is eventually whittled down to feed the plant, and we wind up with cotyledons. But there is an endosperm there initially, and that's basically the whole the whole process of pollination. And every one of these seeds has to receive a pollen tube. So if you've got 30 seeds, say, in a canola plant and you don't get enough pollen tubes that run down to each one because on the day of pollination, it was really hot, the stigma wasn't really moist, so it couldn't germinate. We can have abortion that takes place or we can have uh, lagus bugs feeding on, on the, the actual flower and causing it to abort. So our job is to help this plant get this pollen tube down here and it does it by itself. It's up and down regulating all kinds of genes in that process to help deal with things like, like heat. It has heat shock genes, for example. It's up and down regulating things to try and manage everything. And it's communicating between hormones and so on. I should point out here that this pollen tube has to enter this embryo sac here through some, this tiny little hole called the micropyle. And these synergids here help guide this pollen tube into the final steps of entering the micropyle. It's kind of a, a, a neat kind of trick, and I'll show you a few more uh, shots of it uh, here. So here's a pollen grain, and you can see it's got a little opening. This is a wheat pollen grain. The canola has multiple grains, oh, openings. So here we have a, a mature pollen, and I'll show you actual pictures, but we'll go through the line drawings so you, you understand what you see when, you, when we look at the photos. Uh, so it's covered by, a, 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 it's called an exine, which is, which is a bunch of material that is specific to canola uh, pollen so that a canola plant can recognize that it's the, the exterior part of this that the plant on the stigma recognizes and will actually hydrate it. Because this is dried. Remember I said it's dried so that if it gets out in the environment, it can survive a long time. That's why pollen grains can, can be found a thousand years later and still be uh, active. Once it lands on the stigma, it, it hydrates and it germinates and it extends the end time. You can see that this central tissue then just grows out. And there are only two 
uh, sort of components of a plant that grow like this. A single cell that grows by what is called cytoplasmic streaming. In other words, there's only one cell and it just grows, it eats and it grows. That's the root hair and the pollen tube. A lot of the work on the pollen tube is, is the same as, uh, or the process is the same in a pollen tube and very similar in a root hair in that it grows in a similar fashion, but I'll maybe cover that in another, another webinar. As it grows the pollen tube, here's the genetic material, there's a single cell, and here's what gen, uh, runs, the nucleus that runs the growth of the tube. On the way down, as it grows, though, the sperm splits and forms two sperm cells. The angiosperms have a double fertilization. I said earlier, what happens is one sperm forms the germ, the other one forms the endosperm. So there's a double pollination. And here's the tube cell, which regulates the growth of the pollen tube, okay? So just another shot of it and I'll, I'll couple and, and as it moves along, it plugs behind and it moves uh, nutrients. It has a vacuole here to store uh, things in the plant. It's got mitochondria. It's got all the sort of common things of a cell, but it has all of these vesicles here, which are used to carry nutrients across the cell membrane as the pollen tube is growing through the stigma it has to feed. And here's what it does. It uses calcium variations at the tip and pH to guide itself down the stigma to the embryo of the seed. And you can see that the concentration at the tip is very strong and so is the pH and that's part of the guidance. The calcium is key because cell walls have to be built and calcium, boron, other nutrients are important in cell wall development. So that moves along. And here's a, a, just a diagram. Again, it's, it's kind of complex, but calcium is central in the regulation of pollen germination and tube growth. And the, and the gradation in color, as you can see here, is calcium. So you can see that the calcium is really intense near the tip. And all these transporters are sucking calcium from the external environment and from the vacuole moving calcium in and out in order to support the growth of the cell along with all kinds of other nutrients that are, are used here. There's also some reactive oxygen species that are forming here and the plant has to deal with those kind of things. So that's happening and this thing just grows through that tissue. There's the explanation, here's the real shot. This is the tip of a stigma and you can see it's all covered with pollen and all of these lines are the trace patterns of the pollen tubes that have grown down the stigma and are headed to pollinate each one of those little seeds. When the pollen tube gets there, enters that micro pile, it busts. There's one sperm goes and fertilizes the egg. The other sperm goes here and ties up with these polar nuclei and becomes the endosperm and fertilization is done for that seed. So let's take a look at that. I hope that explains it, but let's look at it in reality. Here's blossom canola. You can see that the pollen is extruded here. The stigma is right there and there's four anthers. Here we go, you can see it's loose on there and it jumps over to the stigma. And I think a lot of that happens by wind, by insects and you know what we can do to enhance uh, insect pollination in canola is always beneficial. I know some guys use nutrient products in order to enhance the nectar itself with polyamines and all kinds of nutrients and and it seems to help with pollination. So this pollen now will land on here and that whole process I just described will take place. Just another shot of it. You can see that the anthers try to move up ahead above the stigma and then this stigma and will grow and become the pod. So here we go, you can see that's all pollinated and we assume that that has grown pollen tubes all the way to each plant. Now here you can see that the tip of the stigma is just covered with these vesicles that secrete nutrients, water, polyamines, all the new boron into there so that when the grain of pollen lands, it can germinate and there is one. This is my, my most prized shot, doesn't look like much, 
But here's the pollen grain right here, and there's the pollen tube. It has actually moved itself up off the surface. And here's another one here. It's out of focus because it's really, really high magnification. But you can see all these vesicles are covered with liquids in order to hydrate this pollen grain and allow it to germinate. Once it enters the cell, uh, the, the tissue of the stigma, it then extracts the nutrients from the stigma as it grows towards its end target to release its pollen or it's, it's a genetic measure. And you can see all these vesicles here are really nicely fluid, fluidized. And I've seen the same thing in wheat and lentils and so on. So that's a common practice in order to hydrate that and germinate the pollen. Here's a pea, if you've never looked at how peas are, are pollinated, this becomes the pod, there's the tip of the stigma, and quite frequently in legumes, they have all these hairs to help attach or for for easy grabbing of the pollen, which will then germinate just like it does in canola. The, the actual stigma and that whole reproductive organ starts to elongate. And if you look inside now, the seeds are all growing and they're all being fed through the septum and, and this little connection to it. And here's just a close-up shot showing peas. You can see that from that septum, there's this that little uh, funiculus, which then provides the nutrient and you can see that here's the vascular system that will supply that photosynthetic sugar and nutrients to that seed and continue to grow it and away you go. So that's the whole process. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I sure got a great kick out of taking those photographs and I have a million others and, and probably this winter I'll, I'll do something more on this. But now, as usual, uh, is there anything we can do? I mean, understanding what's going on and what we do is another matter. Uh, this is uh, quite a well-known table out of uh, Marshner's book, uh, Nutrition of Higher Plants. And we know that these nutrients here, boron, zinc, manganese, copper, calcium, we talked about calcium, are really key during vegetative growth. But look what happens under reproduction. We get huge, huge increases, doubling of manganese, tripling of zinc, more than doubling of boron, and, and I should point out that boron is generally considered more uh, important in dicotyledonous or eudicot plants than in, in grass plants. So the demand in, in all of our legumes and our dicots is much higher um, than in, in grasses. Although we still we still have issues with um, with boron. Uh, for example, I'll just point out one thing: copper. Uh, you know, we always talk about copper related to uh, to cereals, for example, especially wheat. Uh, the fact is, canola on a per bushel basis uses more copper than wheat does. The trick is that canola never seems to be short of copper because it is able to scavenge copper very, very efficiently, uh, just like it can everything else. And, and it's really good at doing that. Uh, one of the, the downsides of something like boron is it's not very mobile when it gets dry. But we'll talk a tiny bit about that. But here's here's what it does. It's involved in pollen tube growth. And we talked about sugar. Zinc is involved in pollen as well because zinc is involved in all the uh, six groups of, of enzymes in plants and, and is really key to the functioning of, of plants. Uh, manganese, lignin uh, formation, same with copper, lignin formation and pollen. And of course, we talk calcium stigma and pollen tube growth. Calcium is, is now emerging as a major signaling agent in plants. It's highly regulated in the plant. And when it's short, the plant knows it and it singles and upregulates its transporters uh, for calcium. And the plant is doing the same thing for all of these things that it's, as it's needed. Okay, here's the nitty gritty though. When we get into this later season here, as we, we go into, uh, late June and July, generally we get drier. So we need to look at the mobility of, of these nutrients in the plant. For example, within the plant, and you can argue about whether this is 100% right or not, but generally we'll, we'll go with this. We know that nitrogen in, in the nitrate form is mobile, phosphorus in the plant is mobile, potassium is mobile, and magnesium is mobile. In other words, if a plant is short, it can go to its old leaves, pull it out and move it up in the plant. 
And that's what happens. That's why you see your bottom leaves starting to dry up and turn yellow as the plant is going into senescence or after into reproduction, if it's short, it'll be moving nutrients out of those lower leaves into the new sink, which are the seeds. But when we take a look at the microbes, we have a problem. Besides uh, high pH soils having uh, making it hard for plants to get some of the microbes, uh, we don't have much movement of the microbes in, in the plants, like copper, zinc, um, moly, uh, sulfur, are not very mobile in the plant. And calcium is not mobile, neither is boron. Boron doesn't move much in the phloem, so the plant can't get much of it. Manganese sure as heck doesn't move in the plant. So as it gets drier and roots aren't growing and nutrients aren't flowing, things like calcium, which are, are, are mobile in, this, in, in um, a move by mass flow, and boron, which moves by mass flow, well, if there's no water, it can't move by mass flow. And if there's no root growing, the roots can't grow it's deeper. That's why an understanding of water is really going to be critical for us going forward. So let's take a look in the soil. Nutrient mobile, mobility in the soil. We know that nitrate, sulfate, and boron are very mobile in the soil. Ammonium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, moly, not as, and phosphorus, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc, almost immobile in the soil. So the roots have to go there and contact them or get them by slow diffusion. So when we tie all those things together and we look at the, the products that are sort of in the marketplace, which are primarily related with you know, phosphorus, uh, some, some nitrogen in the amines form, copper, iron, manganese, and potassium, it becomes pretty tough under dry conditions where we got restriction on, on water flow and we've got restriction on root growth to receive some of these nutrients. So this is where we will generally take a look at maybe we can do something with a foliar nutrient package to retain some of that yield potential uh, and support the growth of the plant through stress. So I just went through my slides to just pull out some of the summaries I've made and highlighted what I think are important relative to pollination time. Barn's important in transport of sugars, cell wall synthesis, lignification, and integrative membranes to support the growth of that pollen tube, to support the growth of all those new, new seeds. 90% of the bee in the cell wall is, is tied up in this one product. So we need that in cell wall because the cell wall of the pollen grain is, or of the pollen tube is moving. And we have that cell wall over and over again. We have flower retention, pollen tube growth, nitrogen fixation. So barn has many functions. And one of the most interesting thing is right across North America, almost over the past few years, there's been a, a uh, a real obvious shortage of boron when we do tissue tests. It, it seems so large and so prevalent everywhere that you almost wonder if the testing method is faulty in some fashion. But perhaps because it's dry, we've been farming this land now for a while. Maybe we're just short, but boron seems to be in, in tissue tests uh, really deficient almost everywhere. Copper, essential for pollen, pollen formation and fertilization. Uh, copper is, is key in so many enzymes that we're now uh, finding that it's really important for, uh, for many, many, many processes. Manganese, uh, I put this in specifically because gibberellic acid biosynthesis, in other words, the formation of gibberellic acid when the other hormones uh, is is really activated a lot by manganese, so we need uh, need that manganese there. We also need manganese as one of the uh, the scavenger of reactive oxygen species, which is part of my uh, my stress management uh, uh, webinar. Zinc uh, in eukaryotes, about four uh, percent of, of zinc proteins are involved in transcription, and transcription, of course, is the the production of of proteins and the uh, uh, the function of, of messenger RNA in terms of, of reading uh, the, the uh, chromosome. So it's really important in order uh, for plants to up and down regulate their genes. And of course, in ribosomes, which produce uh, the protein, and, and zinc is really high in the pollen tubes for protein synthesis. Uh, you know, that's, that's obvious. And lastly, 
we have uh, uh, some of the hormones are now being added to these packages and uh, one of them is, is are called polyamines which is a hormone that is produced in most plants and higher plants the present in the free form the, the primary uh, precursor is one called putrescine and then you form a whole bunch of all the, all the other polyamines and, and there are other mechanisms for doing this but we won't get into that now and they're involved in flower development embryo embryogenesis and development of the embryos um, and we won't talk about the other things uh, senescence and fruit maturation but they're really important in responses to biotic and abiotic stresses and lastly uh, as i mentioned future scene is the central one and, and some of the products that are on the marketplace utilize that as their source of polyamines of, so that the plant can then build the other ones. And you can see that certain amino acids are involved. And copper has a, has a major role in terms of uh, utilization and catabolism of, of polyamines. So that's kind of a general summary of, of the nutrient packages that, uh, that are you know, largely available. There, there are some, some variations across uh, different companies, uh, but, but largely they're, they're very similar. Uh, I like the higher levels of potassium in some of the products, uh, uh, the higher levels of boron because boron is now becoming really prevalent in terms of deficiency, especially as we get later into the season. And it's involved in stem elongation, it's involved in root hair elongation, and of course pollen tube elongation. Uh, it seems to be really, really key in those. Also the hydration of the, uh, the pollen grain when it lands on that sticky surface uh, on, on canola and if it's not sticky the grain can't actually land there, stick there, uh, hydrate and germinate. So all these micronutrients and macronutrients I think give us an opportunity to support the plant moving forward through this stressful time from like I said going into flower from the bud stage until pollinations take place and that elongation of the stigma uh, occur or, or the, um, uh, the style occurs to form your pod. I uh, hope that was useful. Uh, good luck going forward. And if you want further information, take a look at Taurus's website.